Well, this week, the news broke of the Preference Whisperer, who has made a business out of doing preference deals for minor parties in exchange for payments. And there's nothing illegal about that. It was reported that all it cost was $55,000 to arrange upper house preferences, preference deals, which um, is unfortunately, I believe, legal in Victoria. $55,000 isn't much money when it comes to po politics and wrangling. According to Nielsen, when it comes to the world of advertising, the Commonwealth Government is the largest advertiser in Australia, followed by the Victorian Government, which so far in the first half of this year has spent something like $50 million in advertising. Then the third biggest is Harvey Norman. The challenge we face is that for some reason, when it comes to a communication breakdown, we think that as politicians, as parents, as, as churches, the answer is to turn up the volume and shout louder rather than looking at ways to try and to bridge the gap. Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to delve into your word, would you be at work amongst us? Holy Spirit, would you move um, in this place, in this space, wherever this time and space is, as we listen to this message? Would you speak to us? God, would our hearts and minds be directed to you today? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a challenge that we all face, isn't it? As a boss, as a teacher, as a lecturer, as a parent, and even as a pastor. We can feel passionate about getting our message across. And those we are speaking to start to drift off. And all they hear is blah, blah, blah. I once heard the art of speaking is to stop speaking before others stop listening good thing to remember. I remember the first church I worked in, the senior pastor had three daughters who would regularly sit up the back of the auditorium. And if he went too long, they were harsh critics, um, and if he, they went, uh, if he went too long, they would do this fake yawn and then start tapping on their watch and making sure that he could see it above their head. But it is tough when you believe that you have something important to say and to find that those you are talking to have stopped listening. And while marketing gurus and advertisers will say that all you need to do is just to spend more money and shout louder than your competitor, I wonder if what we actually really need to do is to move closer to those to whom we want to communicate with. As churches today, we need to be prepared to move to bridge the gap so that the good news about Jesus can be received by those God loves. And as we wrap up our Moved series, today we get almost like a communication 101 lesson from the Apostle Paul on how to be moved to bridge the gap for the sake of the good news of Jesus, God's Messiah. If you have your Bibles with you, then I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 17, verse 16. If you don't, that's okay, because the words will come up on the screen when we get to it. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. For Christianity today, we struggle with our, with our place in society. Our inherited thinking and structures are based on a Western world mindset in which we no longer live. We long for the days when everyone went to church on a Sunday and the majority of people identified as Christian. And if we believe what the media tells us, then Christianity belongs in a bygone era and the church today is simply irrelevant. But that just isn't true. There is a gap that we have, absolutely. Absolutely. And rather than shouting louder, rather than thumping the pulpit and doing all sorts of things to get people's attention, we need to be moved to bridge the gap. Some 2,000 years ago, a grassroots movement started and underwent a few name changes. Followers of the Way 
and then Christians, the Christian church sat on the edge of society. Then, with Constantine and Christianity becoming mainstream, we entered into a period known as Christendom. The the suggested glory days of the church. And while amazing things happened and growth of the kingdom of God took place, the church was also involved in some significant abuses of power, of people and also of cultures. In recent times, we've moved into a post-Christendom world and the church has lost its standing in the community. For example... In the city of Darabin, since the 2016 census, we have seen a reduction of about 4.5% of people identifying as Christian, down to 38.3%. And 45.2% of the city of Darabin identify as having no religious beliefs whatsoever. So if the world in which we live in looks more like that of the early church, then we could probably learn a lot about how to communicate the good news of Jesus from those who were there at the time. People like Paul. In Athens, there is the Acropolis, with its temples perched on the top of the hill. Off to one side is a limestone-capped outcrop of the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill. By the Romans, where the Athenian council would meet. Now, while Athens had passed its prime from the 4th and the 5th centuries BC, in the 1st century, it was still a world leader in literature, um, in uh, sculpture, in speech, in politics, democracy, philosophy. It was the home of Socrates, of Plato, and it was adopted by Aristotle, Epicurus, and Zenon, or Zeno, sorry. Epicurean philosophers influenced the educated upper classes of the society. They valued pleasure and believing that the gods were pretty disinterested in the activities of humans. Those who followed the philosophy could be summed up with being here for a good time rather than a long time. Stoic philosophy on the other hand, was the most popular form of Greek philosophy. And it was, um, and when the Apostle Paul visited Athens, it was was the mainstream sort of belief, even though people didn't necessarily adhere to every every part of it. Stoics saw the world as determined by fate and advocated that human beings must pursue their duty, live in harmony with nature and reason, however painful this might be, and develop their own self-sufficiency. Stoics commended suicide as an honourable means of escape from a life that could no longer be sustained with dignity. So with that as our kind of political, philosophical and a bit of a religious framework, let's try to do in a few minutes what lecturers and missiologists take weeks to do as they explore Acts chapter 17 verses 16 to 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. He spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also debated with some Epicurean and um, Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus, and his resurrections, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up like some sort of gutter sparrow would pick up crumbs? Others said, he seems to be preaching about foreign gods. Then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things and we want to know more about it. And a little note by Luke. It should be explained that uh, all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. 
For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had an inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I am telling you about. He is the God who made the whole world, the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands cannot serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything. He satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall and determine their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after him and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol design, uh, designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he appointed and proved to everyone um, who this is by raising him from the dead. When they heard uh, Paul speaking about the resurrection of the dead, some of them laughed with contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers. Among them was Dionysus, the member of the council, a member of the council, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. It's interesting that the first thing that we discover is that for Paul and for us, we need to be moved by love. Moved by love of God and for God and moved by love for others. Paul was concerned about those he saw and that they were missing out on the good news, that there was more to living life well than putting a trust in superstition and stone images. Paul cared about their life right now and also for eternity. For us today, we need to be moved by love. Love for God and also love for others. Not a thirst for power or to return to when the church was the centre of society. When I hear of supposed Christians infiltrating in the news, I have no doubt that there is some um, agenda-driven media at play, putting their own spin on things. But I also can't help but wonder if there is a church desire for power rather than loving sacrifice and service. I absolutely want to see people passionate about Jesus in politics. But I also want to see them passionate about Jesus as builders, as cleaners, as truck drivers, as nurses. It should change our motives about what we do and why we do it. To serve God and to serve God's creation. To be trustworthy and to steward well the resources as, um, as people who need to give an account to God about how we have loved and looked after God's creation. Moved by love for God and love for others as well. Paul was also moved by the context and the culture. If you look at this passage, you will notice two significant things. Paul understood the context that he was in and the culture that was around him. When we look through Acts and Paul spends time with Jews and converts to Judaism, um, he, he quotes from the Torah and the prophets. In Acts chapter 13, verse 15 to 43. In Acts 14, verse 1. In Acts 17, verses 2 and 3 and verses 11 as well. But in the context and in the culture where sacred Jewish writings were, were largely foreign, he, move, he is moved by the context and the culture to bridge the gap by referring to the things and the teachings that the audience would readily identify with. And then help them to connect the message that Jesus is their saviour. To an altar of an unknown God. 
Either the altar was one of these wild cards just in case the, um, and, and we just didn't know that there was another God out there and so we wanted to make sure that we could, we could um, worship him as well. Or the original deity's identity had been lost over time. But Paul uses their context and culture as a starting point to communicate the good news about Jesus. And then, when talking to the Athenian council on the limestone hill, Paul continues in verses 24 to 34. While we only have a summary here of what Paul said, what we do see is in the green text on the screen are all the times that Paul refers to their context and their culture. At no time do we see him referring to the Torah or the prophets. He doesn't live in man-made temples, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything. For one man, uh, from one man he created all the nations. Seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. For in him we live and move and exist. We are his offspring. We shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. Quoting from the familiar to those Paul spoke with, he then shared that it is not Zeus, but Hashem, the God of Abraham, who sent Jesus, God's only son, as the Messiah, the saviour and the righteous judge of the world. And that he died for the sins to help restore the broken relationship between man and uh, between people and Hashem, creator of the universe. And lastly, Paul was moved to bridge the gap to Jesus. Paul wasn't there just having an idle chat. Paul wanted to help bridge that gap to Jesus, not help Jesus bridge that gap. For the Son of God taking on flesh and blood, being fully God, being fully human, had already bridged that gap. But Paul wanted to help others to um, know how, uh, what it meant to be followers of Jesus, not Paul as some guru. It was bridging that gap to Jesus and pointing them to who Jesus is as Hashem's Messiah. Today, we live in a culture where those who identify with no religion prefer a scientific and rational evidence-based approach to life. A culture where there are a number of people who think that religion and spirituality are outdated traditions, a crutch for the weak. Rather than believing popular culture that Christianity is for the uneducated and the ignorant, we discover that those who attend church are actually quite well educated that those who regularly attend church are more satisfied with relationships and have a higher sense of contentment. And that the greatest evidence that we can show others that Jesus is real is by living life well and living out a genuine faith. But unfortunately, in our misguided attempts and shortcuts, we can believe that just by quoting Bible passages at people or telling them that they're going to hell is going to bridge the gap, when in fact what it often will do is just widen that gap. Let's learn from the mistakes of poor communication that fuel scare campaigns and believe that shouting louder will get the message across. While it might for some, for others, they will keep on doing what they have always done. But Paul, Paul is a master communicator and shows us a better way to move, a better way to be moved, moved by love for God and love for others, moved by context and culture, to understand what is important to others and why, to see things from their worldview and what moves them move to bridge the gap to Jesus, to help others to see Jesus for who he is and what he has done out of love for us and what he will do for them as well. Helping people to see firsthand the difference that Jesus makes in our life. And just as an aside, 
On the right-hand side of the stairs leading up to the limestone-capped outcrop of the Areopagus is a brass plaque recognising Paul's message of the good news of Jesus that he spoke some 2,000 years earlier. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for the message, the, the, the good news that we find in you. Lord, forgive us for the times that we just think by shouting louder, by shaking our fists, is going to get the message across. It's inconsistent with your heart and it's inconsistent with your desire for us today. Help us to be moved by love. To be moved by love for you as the author and creator of life. But to be moved by love for those that are around us. Those that we see um, in the streets, in the neighbourhoods, in the families that we connect with, in our workplaces, in our schools. Help us to see others as you see them, created in your image. And help us to be moved by love for them. Lord, help us to be able to understand what makes them tick, what motivates them, what has their heart beat faster. And may we be able to help them to see your heart for them. The change that you make in our lives, but also the change that you want to see happen in their life to have each one of us live life well today. Thank you that you are not done with us yet. Thank you that you are not done with Darabin, Melbourne, Australia yet. That you love this country. You created us and you long for us to be in a restored relationship with you. Amen. So how might we respond today? For those at home, for those in the auditorium, for those listening a little bit later. What might it look like to grow in your love for Jesus and for others. What would it take? What, what changes of thinking needs to take place? What commitments do you need to make in that? How well do you look and listen to what others say and what they show you about what is important to them? Or are you too busy wanting to get your message across rather than listening to their heart? And how are you helping others to see Jesus in you and in your faith?